And great singing. You may be seated tonight. Thank you so much. Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews. We're in Hebrews chapter 11. And I'm hoping to finish it up. I don't want to spend a lot of time on... I really wanted to spend some time on defining faith. But um, because it is one of the most common portions of Scripture that is read in the book of Hebrews, and, and um, most of us are pretty familiar with it, I just want to hit some of the highlights, some of the lessons that are taught, some of the things that are interesting. And I think we'll be able to... Um, to get done with it and, and move past it tonight without necessarily going through every, every portion of Scripture that's in there. And I know that there is a lot to be gleaned, but I want to just make the point. So uh, we're going to look at uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We've already gone through verses 1 uh, through 6. We've talked about the definition and I'll just uh, of faith. I want to, because it, it, it's important for... The rest of it, tonight, I just want to kind of look at the effects of faith. So we've defined faith, we've talked about what faith is. Now, the rest of the chapter is really committed to the idea of what it looks like. Once faith is imputed in somebody and somebody has faith, what does that look like? What does it look like when somebody has faith? So we're going to look at these two examples, and there's a reason why they are the ones to kind of start that off. And I know... You've got in uh, verse 5, you've got Enoch, you've got Abel in verse 4 when he's defining it. But now he talks about the effects of it. So look at verse 7. We're going to read verses 7 and 8 real quick and then we'll just jump right in. So if you'll stand with me if you can in reverence to God's word tonight. We'll read Hebrews chapter 11 verses 7 through 8. The Bible says this, it says, By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. We're talking about tonight the effects of faith. The effects of faith. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your truth. God, thank you that you loved us enough to give us a Bible, not just to die on the cross, Lord, and and I don't want to say not just to, because that's, that's everything, the death, burial, and resurrection. But Lord, you gave us instruction. I pray, Father, that you would help us as we look at this element, faith, Lord, being one of those, the, the, the three legs of the chair that holds the Christian up. Lord, uh, uh, when we think of charity, uh, faith and hope. And God, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to understand how this intertwines with the other two, the importance of it. And Father, how we should look with faith in our lives. And Lord, it's something that a lot of us are, are Lord, we're delinquent in. We, we don't have it. And, and we don't have it certainly to a, a point where it changes our lives like it should. I pray, Father, that you'd help us to see the different perspectives of it understand it and and maybe point it in different directions in our life that we could really see some of the promises that you've given us in your word. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter writes and talks about that he's given us all things that pertain to life. And he talks about the promises that you and I can attain with that. Uh, Tonight, when we look at this, now we've we've talked about what faith does. Uh, Faith causes you or, or defining it. And, and we got a lot of that at the beginning. Uh, the very first verse tells us what the, the definition of faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So if you think of it like uh, you, you point it at something, and the more of that you point it at, the more that you get. Faith is really, really intrinsic in that use, that you can, you, what you're going to point it at. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So we've spent some time kind of talking about the substance of faith. Is your, is your faith like sand where it's conforming and it's soft and, you know, and it's comfortable? Uh, and we're going to get into that a little bit tonight with how faith responds, how it affects people. Or is your faith solid? And we used the illustration that Jesus used in the Sermon on the Mount or past the Sermon on the Mount when he talked about uh, those that build their house on the rock and those that build their house on the sand. 
the destruction that comes when we choose to build our house on the sand. And, and the reason is, is because sand is pliable. It moves. It changes. Uh, one of the things we learn in Hebrews specifically is that God is the same, specifically Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. You don't want a faith that is, uh, that is soft. When you think about it in, in regards to the human body, um, and the Bible uses a lot of these illustrations, if you get somebody that works out, their focus is on exercise, their focus is on the gym, their focus is on eating right, their body becomes more, not just more muscular, but it becomes more solid, it becomes more hard. And uh, when somebody decides that their focus is going to be on pleasure more than anything else, uh, maybe the couch potato, they start getting that big belly. Um, and <laughs> sorry, <laughs> some people are kind of looking at me weird. But, but uh, let's not go into the specifics. Let's just say it makes your body soft, okay? It, it makes your body soft. And so w w what's the difference? Because it's still a body. And we're going to talk about this tonight because Romans tells us that every one of us have been given a measure of faith. So the question tonight is this, what is the substance of your faith and what are the things you hope for? And I gave some illustrations that if you take the mom, and I've dealt with people like this in ministry over years, the, the, the lady that she's praying about having a baby, she wants a baby really bad. Now, is that, is that a bad thing to hope for? Uh, no, absolutely not. It's not a bad thing to hope for at all. It's a good thing to hope for. But if it becomes the dominating focus of her life, oftentimes what will happen to her faith is that when God doesn't give it to her, she becomes embittered with the God that created her. And so the substance of her faith becomes geared toward... And this is why what you hope for, what you focus on, can change your theology. It can change the view of your faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So as Christians, we need to make sure if we want solid faith, that what we're hoping for are the right things, are biblical things. And that, I think, is a big problem with a lot of people's faith. They, we'll have incredible faith in a lot of the wrong stuff, a lot of the wrong things. And, and we're going to look at what, what the right faith, um, even in, in a secular sense, is supposed to look like and how that affects us. Because the truth is, it's very easy for us to get our focus off the fact that all of this is temporary. I mean, if you ever like wanted something super bad, I remember when I was painting that stupid dump truck. Remember that? It was sitting out there for a year. I was painting that stupid thing. It's been sitting at, I don't think I've driven it once this year. But for a year, it was a focus for me. And, uh, and, 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 and not necessarily a bad focus, but I would dream about the thing. I spent a lot of money on it. Like, I, I spent a lot of money on the paint and, you know, and, and the primer and, and, and all the different things. I had to replace some parts. I, I, I was in it thousands of dollars. Uh, so it became a focus. And, and I think we have to be careful because I would go to bed sometimes at night. And I remember thinking about, I would dream about being able to drive it. I, seriously. Like, have you ever done that? Like, you, you wanted something, maybe it was that house, and you could just imagine it. You could just dream. I remember the first house Carrie and I bought. I was 23, I think. I was 23 years old, and I had a really good job in Hillsboro. I worked for the bank, the whole thing. And Carrie found this builder. She was walking down um, Hillsboro with Patrick and Brandon in tow, full blown pregnant with Travis. And she's walking down the street and there's these new house, this new housing development that's going up. And she, she met the builder and was talking to him and he's like, you know, if you guys buy this, I'll give you this deal. If you buy this house. And so, and the house, it wasn't even fully built yet. He was finishing the house up. 
And so we went, and my wife was like, he said he would sell it to us for this, and if we buy it, we'll be the first ones in the neighborhood to buy this house, and, uh, and he'll put in a yard and build a fence for us, because we'll be the first ones. And so it's a really good deal. And so we went and got financed, and, and I remember during the whole financing part, he gave us the key, and actually, this is something that doesn't happen. He gave us the key, and he let us move in before we even financed the thing. Yeah. And I remember, like, when we first got it, I remember I opened the door. And, like, in Bible college, I'm thinking, I'm going to be starving on some mission field for the rest of my life. I remember I sat down. It had, like, this, like, it had a, a pretty good-sized front room in it. It was brand new, and a, a brand new house just has a certain smell to it. It's kind of like a brand new car. And I remember sitting on this plush carpet thinking, I would have never dreamed I could have owned something like this. And then I started thinking about moving into it. And, and, and it's very easy to get our hopes on the things of this world. And so what happens is all of a sudden our faith turns to that. Now, listen, we prayed for it. We had faith in God for it. We were, but that, that house doesn't mean anything to me now. It doesn't mean a thing. As a matter of fact, it was somewhat of a hurdle when we decided to come here it was like I was so tired of God trying to get me to go into a church that I just finally I'm like, I have to give up this stuff. And I remember we just had this big wholesale. We sold everything. And uh, we only came up here with the cars we owned. We, we, had to, we had to sell a whole bunch of things, including that house. And, and we literally had to make the decision I'm giving up this life, and I'm going up there. When I came to, to Longview, I was the pastor here for a week before I even knew what I made. I didn't even know what I made. And had I done that, there's no way I would have. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, but, but in seriousness, God had to get me to the point where that wasn't even a focus. And, uh, and, and it was just where my faith was focused on change and it all came down to where my hopes were because for a long time my hopes were i'd really i really want to own a home why don't i own want to own a home praying about that want to own a home want to own a home and uh and, and i've watched things like that pull people out of church and i'm going to tell you why that happens there's a reason why but i want you to look at some of the effects of faith number one Faith separates you from the world. True biblical faith separates you from the world. In, uh, when, we look at, when we look at the first example in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is by faith. So Noah had to forsake the world in order to, not only in order to realize his faith, but to save his family. Amen. And I'm going to tell you that is just as true today as it was when he built that ark. Uh, faith causes us to separate from the world. 1 John 2.15, the Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It's not, saying that, it's not saying that God doesn't love you. It's saying if you love the world, you can't love the world and God at the same time. You're going to invest in one or the other. That's one of the reasons why polygamy was proven so false in the Old Testament when men tried it. it is because there was no... And, the, and what, what they ended up doing is treating women like property because... You can't, God created them male and female. You, you can't invest fully into two people. It, at some point in time, you're going to pull to the one over the other. And so it's, it's true with the world and with God. The Bible says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away. This is key for you and I. To set our hopes on something bigger and better. Because everything that is around you right now, and remember in high school, man, everything seemed so like, 
we got to win this game. And I mean, we would be in, we'd be in the locker room in basketball. We'd be like pumping each other up. And it's like this, this game's, I remember at one point in time, we were, I can't, I think we were, we were at, no, we were vying for state. We were vying to be able to play at state. This was in 1991. We had a phenomenal team that year. And we were, if we won this next game, it was against SeaTac, we were going to state. It was the first time in our, our school's history that we were going to be able to do that. So our coach is in there, and he's given us this pep talk. And he's like, listen, boys, he's like, this game is not just another game. This game is life changing. He said, this is something that you will be telling your kids for years to come if you make it to state and you win this game. Like, we're like, right? They do that to us. You know what that's like. They're like, you got to win this. And those of you that have been in organized sports, I know Dave, he's probably, he's been in organized sports. In school, uh, and, and Daniel, I know you have too, coaches will tell you, it's life or death. You're going to remember this for the rest of your life. Daniel, of course, was in much higher because he was like professional. But, but it's like, for him, it was like, you better win or we won't pay you. But for the rest of us as teenagers, for, <laughs> no, Daniel uh, Orm, <laughs> he, he played basketball professionally. But the rest of us were high school. High school want to be athletes. Actually, Pastor Stewart wrestled in college. So, so a lot of you know what that's like. You know what it's like to be in these, and, and this coach is just telling you, this is life-changing. If you win this game or you win this match or whatever, you're going to be telling your kids forever. Brandon, how many times did winning a state championship in basketball come up in our life? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, well, so it did come up once or twice. I would think that winning high jump probably came up more. Well, we just shoot around in the backyard or something. Yeah. All right, well, you're killing my illustration tonight. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But in the scope of life, it means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. And, and the truth is, is that over, over a 50-year life span, to mention it to your kids a handful of times, it, it, it didn't do anything for my life. It really didn't. Uh, but I'll tell you what, man. I poured everything into it. My mom and dad will tell you, man, we went to games. We were like, I was buying the expensive shoes. Remember those shoes that pumped up? I had them. You know, I mean, it was like everything. It was it, we, it was basketball, you know, I went to the Y and played with my friends and I think my mom and dad hosted, we hosted like a steak dinner at my house with my basketball friends. You know how many of those basketball friends I hang out with or I even talk to anymore? None. Like there's two that I went to church with that I might see at funerals every once in a while, but that's it. That's it. Listen, it, it doesn't mean a thing in life, but we'll point all of our hopes on that, and we will put faith in that stuff. I'll tell you at the time, I had faith in my teammates that they had my back. I had faith that these guys were going to be a part of my life forever. And after four years of high school, it doesn't mean a thing. It doesn't mean a thing. As a matter of fact, I remember probably one of the biggest letdowns of life was we just finished, at the end of 92, I just finished my last, went to nationals for the last time, and everything was focused on trying to, trying to get a medal in nationals in high jump for me. I, I, I hadn't, up till that point, I hadn't been able to do it. And I remember walking across that podium, getting that medal, and I was sitting there in my chair with it, and I'm sitting there looking at this thing, and I remember thinking, after all the excitement kind of went down a little bit, I remember thinking, now what? Now what? And, and then all of a sudden, that summer was, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? What am I going to do? Had all kinds of conversations with parents and, and, and my youth director and I think even my pastor at one point in time because I knew like I had a week where I was like I'm going to Bible college and I'm glad I made that decision but 
Uh, you know, it was just like four years, four years of high school was all centered on the next competition, the next nationals, the next basketball tournament. It was, that was just what it was. And then after that, it was like, now what? The, the, now what? I mean, everything in my life just flushed away. Even the girlfriend that I had, it was like totally just convenient. It's because that's what you were supposed to do. You're supposed to have a girlfriend. And then she left that summer and she's like, promise me you're not going to t be gone when I come back. Oh, sure. I was at Bible college that fall when she came back. I was gone. My mom was thrilled that I did that. But, <laughs> but, um, but it was just everything in my life was just... I realized, and I remember going to Bible college and sitting there, and I'm in a whole new world, in a whole new direction, and now my life has just pivoted toward what God wants me to do, and it just changed everything. And the focus of my entire life was changed just because it went from, not, and it's not like I was a carnal kid, I, I loved the Lord, but I was distracted. And I, this is what I fear, as many of us, our hopes, our hope has been hijacked Amen. That's right. so we don't have faith. The substance of our faith is soft. And it just, it just vacillates from, uh, from opportunity to opportunity, from job to job, from high to high. And God is not given the focus that he's supposed to get. This is what faith does. Faith makes Noah get on an ark. Listen, Noah gets in, on an ark with never in his life experiencing rain. Noah gets on an ark in a world that was so perfect. I get it was fallen, but his world was so perfect. People were living for hundreds of years. Noah gets on an ark, an uncomfortable ark, and forsakes and leaves a world you and I can't even understand. And he gets on an ark. And after seven days, it's a good illustration of the seven-year tribulation. After seven days, a f it starts raining. The waters break up. And the entire earth that he knows is totally destroyed. I mean, think about that for a second. Because we just read these portions of Scripture and we just move through them because we've heard the accounts so many times. They're almost not even real to us. Noah was a real guy with real fears, a real father that had real hopes and dreams just like you, that was leaving a world that had all the things that could possibly be offered. Maybe he had dreams of Shem was really smart and he thought he's going to be a great chemist. He's got, he's got a shot at, at, uh, at the University of Babel. You know, and he's going to be phenomenal in that field. And, and maybe, maybe Ham owned all kinds of, of, um, of uh, 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 pasture, all, all types of land. And he had all of these things. I mean, listen, they had their own. They had things. They had lives. And he gets on an ark. But if we could have Noah... And we could sit him down here. And we could take some people that lived in that time and we could sit them in here. Noah would be like, I'm so glad I followed God. Amen. And the rest of them would go, I sure wish I didn't live for the world. Right. We forget that. We forget that. The Bible says in, first, in John chapter 15, verse 19, it, uh, If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world... But I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you, hateth you. And Noah went through that while he was, his faith didn't just get him on the ark, his faith got him through all that time of building it. And, and I wonder if, if our faith is strong enough. Sometimes we think if we do the right thing for uh, a couple months, well, wow, you know, where's my medal? Where's my award? You know, um, Noah went, went for a long time building that ark. Then we look at Abraham. So Noah represents separation from the world. But Abraham, he represents family. Sometimes the biggest obstacles to God's will in our lives is our family. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 through 37, 
Jesus would say this. He would say, Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and the man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I want you to notice a, a common theme here too is, is that they're all having to leave comfort and stability. They're having to leave what they depend on. Abraham had to leave Ur of the Chaldees. And what's even more is in verse 8, the Bible says, By faith, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should, he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed, and he went out not knowing whither he went. He didn't even know where he was going. And this isn't in a day and age where you get in your car and go, and you're just like, hey, wherever God wants me to go, and, and yet you, you wake up the next day, and, and maybe you're in McCall, Idaho, and you pull off, you're like, I'm hungry. I, you know, it's been a long trip. I'm pulling off. There's a Burger King right there. No, none of that was around. When, when he went where he didn't know where he was going, the, he didn't have all of, the, all of the, the facilities, all of the things that we have today. He didn't climb into an air-conditioned car. He went. And, and I wonder today if, if we have that same kind of, that same kind of uh, uh, fortitude, that same kind of resolve uh, that, that uh, we would be willing to leave those comforts. We would be willing to leave that stability. Moses represents something else in this. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, 24 and 26 through 26. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect, for he had respect unto the recompense of of the reward. What does that mean? He had respect unto the recompense of reward. It means that he could see there was more, there was a better reward for following God later than for living for him, than the temporary joys of living for himself now. That's what it means. He, he saw the recompense of the reward. He realized that if he lived for God now, he, 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 he wouldn't get the temporary pleasures of sin. But the temporary pleasures of sin, they come with a great cost. When you and I live for ourselves right now, it's going to cost you. Normally it costs you, if you're a parent, it generally costs you your family. But when you're a kid, it costs you a lot of things that you're not even counting on. Virtue, your future, things you can't even see afar off. And that's true for all of us. Is the question today is, what are you going to live for? He gives up riches, comfort, stability. John chapter 12, verse 25. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal, unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Luke chapter 9, verse 57, the Bible says, And it came to pass that as they went the, in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Great thing for a Christian to say, right? God, I'll follow you wherever you go. But this was Jesus' response. Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests. What do those represent? Homes. Family. Foxes have holes. Birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not to where to lay his head. What, what's he telling them? He's telling them, hey, listen, if you're going to follow me, a lot of the comforts of this life you're used to may not be in place. He says this, he says, 
And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Listen, he isn't saying that, the, the guy isn't saying my dad died and I need to go bury him. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 don't bury him. What he's saying in this portion of scripture, what it means when you do a word search on it and you look it up, is that it, he's talking about the longevity. You know, my, my family's depending on me. That's what he's saying. And one of the first things that you find, one of the first group of people that get called by Jesus Christ in his ministry is two sons. And what do they do? They forsake their nets, their livelihood, and their father, and they follow him. They follow the Lord. That's what their faith did. Now, now listen, kids, I'm not saying that, uh, that I'm done with this, Josiah. I don't want you to run into my house saying, I'm done. I'm taking off. Have one of those sacks with the thing, you know, that you see in the cartoons. Uh, what, what, what I'm saying is, is that your focus needs to be on the things of God, not on the things of this world. It needs to be your hopes. What are your hopes wrapped up in? You'll notice, a, you'll notice a solid difference between a kid that says, I want to serve the Lord, than one that says... I want to be president of the United States. Or I want to make a lot of money. Listen, sometimes God uses those. And there's examples of it in the Bible. Philemon was not a poor man. But God used those riches to comfort Paul. Listen, I believe that God uses people. I believe that he uses, uh, we just had our first responder Sunday a few weeks ago. I think that's a calling, whether it's a nurse or a police officer or a firefighter. I don't want to do it. I'm not called to do any of that stuff. I don't want to deal with the drunk down the street. I'm, I'm thankful that there are people that do. And, and listen, I'm thankful that there are Christians that do a lot of that stuff. You know, what a blessing it would be for a lost, unsaved person that the last person they talk to in this life is a saved nurse that gives them the gospel. That happens more than you know. Uh, Brother Green, who was a, a, was a firefighter in Scapoose for years, he was telling me how many opportunities he had had to give people the gospel. And he's like, hey, if they're asking, if they're asking for hope, he's like, they're, they're, and, and, and they're on their way out. It's pretty hard for them to sue you. If they're on their way out of this life. He's like, you get a lot of those opportunities. There's a lot of those opportunities. Uh, Moses gave up the richer, riches and the comforts of this world. Uh, that another disciple said to Jesus, the Bible says another said also, or said another, and another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid farewell. Which, uh, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man having put, in, put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. What, what does that mean? You can't say bye to people? No, it means it needs to be more of a focus than we've made it. And so a lot of us have integrated God in our life. And the way that we do that is our hopes and dreams become kind of a Christian themed. And so, you know, you'll get these guys that they're skating for Jesus. I remember when Tim Tebow was a big deal. And I, I, I even preached a couple messages on it, but I have a really tough time with somebody who misses church every Sunday to go play a game. And then he says, well, that's my, it's my platform. It's my platform. How many churches have been started because Tim Tebow played football? How many mission fields? Because Tim Tebow played football. Listen, I'm not saying that you can't have a platform, you can't be good, and that God doesn't use those things. He does, but he doesn't violate his will to do them. The greatest faith always seems to happen when we leave our comfort and security. And there's a reason for that. Because faith is stepping out into the unknown. You can't live, even Jesus defined, you're not living by faith if you can see it. It really is the best proof of what we claim to believe. Matthew chapter 14, verse 28, the Bible says, And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou 
If it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And, and he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. He cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of what? Little faith. Wherefore didst thou doubt? Listen, you can condemn Peter all you want, but Peter was willing to leave the ship. He was willing to leave the other guys. And at least God looked at him and said, you got some faith. It was little, but he at least had some. It was enough to get him out of the boat. It was enough to get him out on the water. And for the first time in history, someone other than the God of heaven walked on water. An awesome feat. Faith always requires a step into the unknown. Thus we call it a step of faith. You're never going to really experience faith, have faith and experience it if you're not willing to step out and do something for the cause of Christ. Faith always requires a step. It always requires you and I to leave a little bit of those comfort zones. It, it, it requires us to get to the point where we stretch past what we believe. I, I, I've talked about the difference between belief and faith. Belief is solid. We often use the idea of a chair and sitting in a chair. Listen, for me to go back and sit in one of these chairs is absolutely no faith. I, I don't even, there's no doubt. I know the chair is going to hold me up. I, I, I've sat in the chair a hundred times before. And, and so I know that, I know the chair is going to hold me up. That's not a good illustration of faith. It really isn't. That's belief. I, I believe, I don't have faith that it's going to hold me up. I believe it's going to hold me up. There's a difference. The definition of faith is in the word belief, and the definition of belief is in the word faith. But the difference between the two is faith always contains a little bit of doubt. It always contains a little bit of doubt. And, and, but you're stretching past your doubt. And when you take those steps, it's funny, you know, I've been with missionaries who have taken me into bad areas and I've been with people and I remember years ago we went to, uh, when Carrie and I were in Bible college, we went to South Central LA. They're, they had a mission down there. It was such an eye opening for a guy that grew up in Everett, Washington and the last place I lived was in Muckle Teal. You know, it, it's, Muckle Teal is a high end place to live and so that's what my life was used to, you know. I mean, um, I, North Everett isn't the nicest place in the world, but I'm telling you, it ain't the ghetto. You know, it's not straight out of Compton or anything like that, you know. It's like, so I remember, I remember going to South Central L.A., and they get us off of this, this, this bus, and they're, uh, some of the guys that were with us were armed. And they're standing there, and I remember just stepping outside of it, and people walking by me, and they're like zombies. There were like fires in the streets. And I'm like, this looks like an apocalypse. Like, I didn't know places like this existed in the United States. I remember just being blown away at what I saw. Like, people shooting up right there on the streets. People passed out. Now, you can go to Portland and see that now. But it didn't used to be like that. <laughs> And I, and I certainly didn't grow up. Some of you kids that have gotten used to it didn't used to be like this. And, and I remember going there and just thinking, how in the world does a place like this exist? And I, but I remember the, the boldness and the confidence of the people that were there that, like, it was no big deal. I'm like, I don't want to shake hands with this guy. It looks like he hasn't taken a shower in, like, four years. And, and he was just picking his nose a second ago. And, you know, and, and I mean, like, the whole place was dirty. I didn't want to sit on anything. You know, it was just like, it was a level of filth I'd never experienced. And they wanted to feed us. 
And I remember the relief that I had when the guy that brought us said, we can't stay for lunch. I'm like, praise the Lord, we can't stay for lunch. But I, it was just such a foreign thing to me. But the people that were working with him, they were used to it. And it was because they, their faith, they, they had stepped out. They had been there. They had witnessed. They had walked those streets. They had tried to win those people to the Lord. They weren't afraid anymore. They weren't intimidated by it anymore. They had seen it. Uh, the, the, the faith, the doubt that was in them was gone. They'd seen God work. And you'll see missionaries that will do that too. The missionaries that will go in dangerous parts, they don't care. They're not afraid because they're not serving this life. It's not that they're not in danger. It's that they're trusting in someone else. Their hope's geared towards somewhere else. And I wonder today if we've lost a little bit of that. Faith, faith focuses on the promises. It doesn't just leave security. It focuses on the promises. Hebrews eleven seven. 7. Listen to what it says. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, prepared the, an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, and look, became heir of the righteousness, which is what? By faith. By faith. Talks about Abraham, but look at what Abraham did in verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of what? Promise. He focused on the promise. As in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles, with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. They were focused on the promise, not on the circumstances. Verse 10, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. He was looking past this life into the next. Uh, Hebrews 11, 11, the Bible says, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had what? Promised. She delivered and had a child because she focused on that promise. Now, was her faith perfect? Ask Hagar. She didn't have a perfect faith. And that's where you and I can be encouraged. God's not asking for a perfect faith. I always remember something that Pastor Yant said. We were talking about salvation and um, people that will doubt it. Because him and I both had struggled with that when we were younger. And he told me something that has just kind of resonated. He said, you know, when I got saved, he said, and I just told, I told God at one point in time, I don't have a lot of faith, but I'm giving you all that I have. That's all God requires. Aren't you thankful for that today? Charles Spurgeon once said, little faith will take your soul to heaven. Great faith will bring heaven to your soul. Hebrews eleven, twenty four. 24, we look at Moses. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Wait, he didn't even know who Christ was. He hadn't even received that promise. But they were Christ's afflictions. The Bible says, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches. His, his hope was focused on something different. A greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect under the recompense of the reward. Look, skip down, look at verse 39. In our text tonight, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39, the Bible says, And, and these all, having obtained a good report, through what? Faith. A good report through faith. Received not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. What does that mean? Well, A, they didn't get the promise. They didn't get to see Christ. They didn't get to see that, that heavenly Jerusalem that's coming. But that's where they were focused on nonetheless. And this is the cool thing. You and I are included in this. You and I are included in this. Look at the end of that again. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, receive not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. 
We need them as much as they need us. Every example in this hall of faith is an Old Testament saint. But where do you and I fit in here? We're the fulfillment of what they were focused on. We're the fulfillment of their hope. Because we've received the Son of God because we look back at Him. Listen, Christian, faith sees the long-term promise instead of the temporary comfort. That's why the very substance of faith are those things that are hoped for. And we know what these examples of godliness, uh, we know that they had faith. And we know what they have faith in because we can see it. We see what faith made them do. We see their focus of faith because we see where it made them go. But the question for you and I is, where's our faith? They were willing to sacrifice for theirs. Uh, we know, too, they left the things they left to do it. Number three, what promises they were trying to attain. They weren't going after the, the job. They weren't going after the high salary. They weren't going after the house on the hill with the cars. If you and I were given the same test tonight, and you and I were put in Hebrews chapter 11, what would be the testimony? If people were to open up our bank account, would there be a clue of our, where our faith is? If people were to look in our homes, look in our garages, if people were to open up our personal things, I love that song, May All Who Come Behind Us Find Us Faithful. There's a verse in it um, that, that talks about uh, our children sifting through all we've left behind. May the clues that they discover and the things that they uncover lead them to the road we each must find. Would that be the case for our kids? Would that, be, would that be what was written about us based on what people see in our sacrifice and, and the things that we're willing to leave to do and, and the promises that we're trying to attain? If you and I were given the same test, someone were to examine our life to see our sacrifice, our investments, what we've given up, and what promises we're trying to attain, what would they think your faith is in? I want you to consider something tonight as we close. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you all know this verse. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You all have heard that a hundred times. But have you ever considered the verse that follows it? For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, listen to this, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. One of my favorite things to watch, I like watching strongman competitions. And like one of my favorite people to watch, he just retired this last year. He retired as the strongest man on earth, Brian Shaw. He's like six foot eight. He weighs about 440 pounds. And the guy has broke tons of records and he is just this massive human being. And he can move incredible amounts of weight. He leg presses a car. It's just like what he does. He rolls up frying pans. He does all kinds of things. Like He's just a massive human being. One of the strongest people, at least in our day and age, to walk the face of the planet. And um, he was training another guy for world's strongest man. His name's Evan Singleton. And Evan Singleton is another guy. He's not as big as Brian, but he's a big dude. And he's just built. But Evan can never make it to the podium. Just struggles. And Brian Shaw told him something that is a great illustration of this measure of faith. He told him, he said, you need, to, you need to imagine you've got this container of water. And this water, it's energy. And he took this container of water, it's energy. And he took all four or five events at World's Strongest Man. And I think there's eight events at Strongest Man on Earth. And he says, 
you need to use. He's like, because everyone's trying to break the deadlift record, and they go in and they kill themselves trying to break the deadlift record. And he's like, and then they don't have any room for the log press, and then they don't have any room for the leg press, and then they have a bag toss. Like, they throw, I think it's something like a 40-pound keg over their head, and Brian Shaw had the record for a long time, 23 feet. Imagine throwing 40 pounds, 23 feet in the air. And, and, and I mean, that's some of the stuff they do. And he's, he's saying you got to take each. And he took it. And Evan Singleton, for the first time, took a third place podium, world's strongest man. And, and, he, and he just telling him, you got this, you got this measure of water. Where are you going to put it? The Bible tells us everyone in this room, every one of you, has a measure of faith. And I want you to imagine you got this measure of faith. You got job. You got home. You got family. You got God. Where are you going to pour it all? Where's it going to go? God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, the Bible tells us where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the whole body will be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. He doesn't say you don't have light. He says if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And what's his point? The, the, the light, if, if, you're, if your eye is single, it's full of light. But if there's darkness, how great is that darkness? If the light is full of darkness. And look at how he ends it. No man can serve two masters. So where are you going to put your faith? Where are you going to invest it? If faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. The question tonight is this. Where's your hope? Where's it pointed at? And that's probably why. That's that's probably going to answer a lot of the questions that you have. Why don't I win more people to the Lord? Why is God not as real to me as he should be? Why when we talk about having those experiences, those Red Sea experiences, where you see God do incredible things? And we've got people that are in the church that they're just focused on that. I got a text, and I hate using her as an example all the time, but I got a text from Shady here recently. I want to read it to you. And of course, she's not at church tonight because she's backslidden and she's not serving the Lord. I'm just kidding. She says this. She she sent this to me. She said, you want to hear something cool? Since Ethan and I got saved, 27 other souls... Loved ones have been saved. 27. Do you know, I know Christians that have been saved for decades. Decades. That haven't saved even a small fraction of that. And you have to start kind of asking yourself inside, why? See, the problem is, is a lot of us, we don't care. We don't want to live our lives. It's, it's not important. But I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a day very soon where we are all going to be gathered together. And we are going to see the events of the white throne judgment. And we are going to see those people that we've had opportunities with. Amen. That's right. And we are going to watch what's going to happen. That's why when you go into that portion of Scripture... It says that he's going he's gonna to wipe every tear from every eye. No more death, no more pain. That's not for the lost. That's for the Christians right after that white throne judgment seat that have watched relatives, neighbors, work associates, and everybody else. We don't have time to develop more faith. We just need to get the faith that we have and point it in the right direction. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's hoped for in the evidence of things not seen. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed.
With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you have that measure of faith and you were to picture that tonight, can I ask you where are you pouring it? Where, where are you pouring it? Where's it going? I get that, listen, I, I work too. I, I work a job too. Just like everybody else, I'm very busy. It's like I've never been more busy than I am right now. Like in my life, I've never been more busy than I am right now. And it's very easy to get distracted. It's very easy. And, and, and I know what it's like to have a wife that says, your kids are growing up without you being here. We, we had committed we weren't going to do that. I know what that's like. But I also know this. There is a God in heaven that is in control. There's a God in heaven that has created me for a purpose. And if there was a New Testament hall of faith, man, I want to be in it. I, I want people to be able to look in my bank account. Why does this guy give so much to a church? I want people to be able, my neighbors, to see me dress up and, and go, man, they're going to church. It's Wednesday. It's in the middle of the week. What are they going to church again for? I, I want people to, to see that. I want, I want the excitement and the energy that, that it's like the thrilling. A lot of times somebody like, like maybe even a shady that comes into, into view and, and, and they come up and they're excited about the things of God. And a lot of times I've actually seen people kind of even just say, yeah, that's good. That's nice. You know, and it's like, why is one person more excited about it than the other? And yet angels in heaven are celebrating over this. And we just can't seem to find that joy. I wonder if it's because our hope is just pointed on something completely different. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And what a powerful statement at the end of those verses. It says, without faith, it's impossible to please him. And then he shows us all of these examples of faith. People that separated from the world. People that separated from their family. People that separated from their riches. People that separated from their comfort. And they made such a difference. Not just for the life that they lived, but even now. Their calls of faith echo through the scriptures. The hall of faith. God, I pray, Father, that you'd help us to be people of faith. Lord, I pray that you would just help us to take it one day at a time, one step at a time, one thing at a time. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand together. Jesus, keep me near the cross. In number 65, if the Holy Spirit has spoke to your heart, the altars are open as we sing. Jesus, keep me everything they forsook all that listen just one thing at a time start pointing your hope to seeing Jesus Christ again and I promise you it's gonna start changing start pointing your hope on that time with him in the morning when you're reading your Bible and and, and start start focusing on that start focusing on those promises start there I'm not asking you to give up everything because the fact is I don't even think God's asking you to do that. He's asking every one of us to be willing to. And that in our hearts and in faith we're so focused on Him 
that it changes our faith. It changes the substance of it. You've seen people. We have people in this church. They get excited about the things of God. And sometimes when you're not, you don't understand it. You don't get it. How are they so happy with it? And a lot of times their lives aren't that good. It's like you're looking at their cars breaking down all the time. And, and they're struggling with this. And they're having problems with that. And they don't have any money. And, but they're so excited. They're so happy for the things of God. It's not an act. So they've pointed their hope on something greater than the things of this life. Moses knew the misery of riches. But he also knew the joy of serving an almighty God. It wasn't perfect. And that's not what God's calling you to be. He's just calling us to focus our hope so our faith has some substance. Amen. Brother Stewart, you want to close us in prayer tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the day. We thank you so much, Father, for allowing us to be here tonight, Father. We just pray for those that are not able to be here, Lord. We thank you, Brother Meeks in the hospital. And just bless and take care of him. Pray for Kelly, sister as well, the Lord. Keep her safe as she travels there. And Lord, I just uh, thank you so much for the good help that we have, Lord, that allows us to be here to hear your word. I pray that you encourage us, Father, in it. Help us to serve you with the efforts and the energy that we do have. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you.